give me the you okay yes okay well as you as you know Stephen Hawking died yesterday and that which was a very sad event but of course it's wonderful he was able to live so long with the with the amyotrophic <coughs> lateral sclerosis so I just wanted to little, say just a little bit about his <coughs> his life and my relationship with him I haven't had time to prepare anything what little time I had last night I was had some deal with some interviews that people wanted to ask questions about him and stuff and then <laughs> trying to figure out whether it's possible to go to his funeral or whatever but uh, anyway well as you perhaps know Stephen Hawking was born 300 years to the day after the death of Galileo and Stephen was born in, in, in January the 8th 19, 1942 and then he lived in the, it was born in St. Albans and <clears throat> well when to school there and then and then uh, let's see if I got this right he went to Oxford as an undergraduate and well claimed he claimed he only studied a thousand hours during his whole time there because he said the attitude was that either either you were very bright and you got by without studying or or if you were less less uh, bright you're just supposed to accept your limitations and anybody that tried to work hard to get out of their class was viewed as a gray man, whatever that was supposed to mean. God, somebody explain, is it, was this just Oxford slang or is... Andrew, what is a gray man? I'm afraid it sounds like, I've not heard it in my generation, sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay, maybe it was a... Anyway, but then at the latter days of, of that, of course, as you know, he began stumbling and, and then was diagnosed with this amyotrophic lateral scler sclerosis, which in the U.S. is sometimes called Lou Gehrig's disease after this Yankee ball player a long time ago that contracted it and usually of course you one uh, succumbs to this to I should put out something that I don't go too long uh, that usually one succumbs to this in just a few years but you know he continued living in as and well he, he got there he depressed for a while and I think listened to a lot of Wagner he still listened to a certain amount of Wagner when I lived with with, with him later but uh, he uh, Anyway, but then, then his degree, his, his disease was progressing less rapidly, and he realized, well, he better get some stuff done. So he worked hard on his thesis, and, and then did collaborations with, with, well, who was motivated by by some work with Roger Penrose, who who'd shown that there were singularities inside black holes, and he was able to modify the theorems to show there were singularities in the in the in, in the early universe. So basically, using classical general relativity. Without quantum effects, he basically proved under certain conditions that our universe seemed to have that even if it wasn't completely homogeneous and isotropic, it would still have a beginning. So, so for, and then at a later time, he talks about coming to the realization of this shortly after his daughter Lucy was born, and he was getting himself ready for bed, but that was a slow process, and he he realized that if you define the surface of a black hole in the proper way, which is now known as the event horizon. That in classical, in classical theory, assuming certain energy conditions that of positive energy, that black holes could only grow. So those were two very important classical results he had. And then, uh, well, then 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 later in the in the around 1972, Stephen Hawking began applying qu quantum theory to to black holes, and he found that when you apply quantum theories, then you can have negative energy densities and black holes can actually shrink. They can produce particles and, and, and shrink away. There was some history of this in the sense that, that uh, I played a really tiny part in this in the, in the sense that I was a graduate student mainly under, under Kip Thorne, although later when Hawking came there, I worked with Hawking and Skip had me list him as a co-supervisor. But anyway, uh, Saul Tikolsky had separated the equations for the electromagnetism for photons and for gravitons and for neutrinos around rotating black holes. And they found that these were amplified. And I was trying to think, well, what is that quantum mechanically? And it took me an embarrassing long time to realize, well, that's stimulated emission. So there should be spontaneous emission that rotating black holes should be able to give up their rotational energy. And we, in fact, invited Feynman over to our to discuss this and he eventually agreed that that sounded right. He also explained there was a mystery that, that uh, <clears throat> Tikolsky and Press had because they, they, they 
found that neutrinos just solving the wave equation even the super radiant they thought it should be amplified but they weren't and then Feynman went to the board and said I, I can explain it I'm supposed to be good at these diagrams and <laughs> he explained it was the Pauli exclusion principle applied even at the level of the classical wave equation for neutrinos that they weren't amplified so I was kind of elated that there was this idea and then I was reading in some of the literature about the amplification by Zeldovich and Starbinsky and I found they had a sentence in there they said there should be an analog of spontaneous emission so of course I was kind of crestfallen I wasn't the first but I thought nobody was calculating so maybe I would calculate it but meanwhile one of the postdocs Doug Early told Hawking about this Hawking had not heard of Zeldovich's and Starbinsky's prediction so he talked to them about it at, 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 at at Moscow he liked their idea but he didn't like their derivation so he was going to go back and do it himself and then when he did it he <clears throat> he did tell me I think at one time that that because these the particular formulas had some gamma functions in it, and I said how did you do that in your head and he said well I actually had Steve Sickless help with the equations but I knew the I knew the general nature of the answer he said although I didn't know what a gamma function was at that time but <laughs> but uh, he knew the qualitative nature but the, de the, the particular details he did so he, he discovered that well first he found that the black holes were but he, there was a problem it looked like they were emitting an infinite amount but then he realized that was because the black hole was just there forever and so it, then he realized it was a certain rate per time and then he discovered that it had a certain temperature and that made consistent some ideas that Bekenstein had had earlier that black holes have entropy but Bekenstein had not proposed that black holes have temperature and so there would be an inconsistency if you had a finite entropy but the black holes couldn't emit because it was thought the black holes could only absorb so since Hawking found the emit and then he also found that they did have a temperature then he was able to verify Bekenstein's idea of an entropy proportional to the area and find that the coefficient well in certain natural units is one fourth so that comes just as a very simple image of this because um, uh, but you could check whether it's right or not so what I was always told is like spe in space, you get particles and antiparticles being right. created and dissolving all the time. Um, virtual particles and antiparticles. Right, right. It's like a kind of foam. Right. But if you write close to the event horizon, um, the part of the black hole can steal one of those virtual particles. And it's like stealing a negative five pound note. Or a negative five shekel note, whatever. Uh, so so, so the, the, the other part gets off into space. So, so you get a very, very, very slow evaporation rate from black hole. Right, is right. That, is that simple picture? Yeah, yeah. No, that's why I was, yeah, because it, effectively, if you measure energies relative to infinity, if you have a particle at rest, of course, the closer it is to the hole, the, 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 the greater the absolute value of the gravitational potential energy, and that's negative. And so if you had something static, when you got it to the horizon, it had zero energy. And so there are inside, although you can't get out from inside, but there are, there are effectively what you call negative energy states. So normally of course you have a particle antiparticle pair produced they can't be they can't stay real just in in flat space I mean unless there's some electric field or something to produce it because you would violate energy conservation you'd start with zero energy and then you'd have two particles going out but here the the one that goes into the hole actually has negative energy and so carrying negative energy into the hole is equivalent to that positive energy going out and that positive energy is going out is carried by the the antiparticle of this I mean of course it could be the could be either the particle going out or the antiparticle, but then the opposite goes go, goes in. So anyway, that was a great discovery, and then and and so then I began gearing up. I would calculate the do numerical calculations of the rate because you have to solve the differential equations for the waves, because basically you need to know how much does the black hole absorb, and then you'd use the detailed balance that it would emit using the thermal factors, but you have to have the absorption. So I was doing that for my thesis, and then. Kip Thorne got Stephen Hawking to come to Caltech for a year, 1974 to 75, as a Sherman Fairchild scholar and <clears> her <throat> fellow. So, you know, then I got to meet him. Then I was told it might take about a week to get to be able to understand his voice. I was somewhat encouraged after two or three days I could partially understand him, but then, <clears throat> you know, when it got to week, I still couldn't understand. So I suppose I'd imagined a uh, step function of you know uh, no understanding after week that but it was more more like this sort of process and it took a quite a while <laughs> and, it, and of course I say it asymptotes to some constant value which isn't perfect understanding but if it was a quiet room then <laughs> then you know he could understand and then well then he went Stephen went back to England and I took me a year to finish up my thesis we did we did write one paper together about uh, possible primordial black possible gamma rays from primordial black holes if there were any but 
none has been seen since, and it's probably because the number of little primordial black holes produced in the early universe is just too small. I mean, we now think the early universe was quite smooth with very small fluctuations. So you'd be, if you had Gaussian distributions, you'd have to be sort of like five, how many sigma? 10 to the, maybe 10 to the four sigma or something, 10 to the four standard deviations off if, if it was to produce. So there's probably not many produced. Anyway, there's no evidence of that. But then, uh, <clears throat> well, Hawking was writing letters of reference for me. And then he said, well, I've been writing letters of reference, but by the person he was supporting, Gary Gibbons, was invited to Munich for a year, so that freed up some money. So he offered some, uh, for, to hire me as a, as a postdoc uh, <clears throat> in Cambridge. So I went there in 1976. And I guess after I'd accepted, then when Hawking had come to, to uh, Caltech, this was the first time he had two students come with him. And uh, Bernard Carr, I guess, lived in the apartment that they had, or the house across from Caltech, and sort of helped him out with that. And then basically, I think they had, Bernard write to me to ask if I would be interested in this arrangement. They didn't, the Hawkings didn't do it themselves because they didn't want, you know, I think they were being very careful not to put pressure on me because this was entirely separate from the thing. But I thought, well, this would be a wonderful, you know, experience. Bernard somewhat underestimated the time it would take. He thought it was five, five hours a week, but it's more like 20. But anyway, I would help Stephen get up in the morning and, and get dressed while his wife would get their children ready for, for school and then go in with Stephen to the, you know, to the department and then usually maybe show him some preprints and he would, he would read those. Naively, you might think with a brain of mind, he'd read very quickly, but it was rather slow, but I realized it's very difficult to go back to the papers. So he would have to understand them, you know, and, and remember them on, the, on first reading. So he did tend to take the time to really absorb the, the, the papers. But, uh, you know, and then we'd have the tea time at 11, and then usually I'd work an hour between 12 and 1, and then we go to lunch in the cafeteria, and that was usually too noisy to be able to understand him very well. <laughs> there, I remember once, well, he would usually order something, he would tell me, and one day I remember he ordered something, and I couldn't understand it, I couldn't understand it. And then finally, I realized he, he changed the pronunciation from tomato to tomato. And then I, and then I, and then I, under, I understood it, even though intellectually I knew tomato was British for tomato. But, but it, didn't, it didn't go through my thick skull at the, at the, at the, at the, at the one moment. So yeah, so then at that time, Stephen was getting interested in, in, in Euclidean quantum gravity of, of making time imaginary. And so I was doing some work on that, finding some, gra well, proving some positive action theorem and finding some gravitational instantons and, 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 and such. And then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, then I, then it, well, and then also, I, I think uh, during that time, Stephen wrote his, his paper about the unpredictability of black holes, and he was that the pure states would go into mixed states when the black hole evaporated completely. I didn't pay too much attention. It sounded like a great idea when I was there, uh, <clears throat> but I didn't I didn't pay too much attention to it. And even during the time when I was well, I, so, sorry, he did that when I was at Caltech, but but uh, even the time in Cambridge, I never really looked like a great idea, but I didn't really think about it too much. But then I got a position back at Penn State University. I was invited to go teach at my, give a talk at my alma mater, William Jewell College. Um, and I thought, well, I'll give a talk on predicting the unpredictability of black holes. And then I looked at the paper and I got, I sort of thought, well, this looks like it's based on the semi-classical approximation. How do I know that this is really right? And so then after giving the talk, I wrote kind of a, the first paper questioning whether the information would be lost. And I gave a number of, a number of alternatives um, with what I thought was maybe the most conservative was that the information was not lost, but I also had some other ways in which it could be lost. And uh, I think I, well, in one way I said, well, maybe it's lost, but I even got to quote uh, the Psalms, the, the die is cast, no, Proverbs, the die is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So I got that in the Fizrev letters <laughs> to illustrate one particular point there. So uh, yeah, then I got a, as I say, I had this position at Penn State and I would go back in the summer to, vi to visit Hawking. And then uh, I remember one day there was somebody that Stephen knew and I, I can't remember who it was, but 
<laughs> he came up to Stephen and said, oh, is Don, Don still working with you? And Stephen said, no, he's working against me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> at this stage, you know. <laughs> but uh, there, was, there, there was one other issue, I guess, that I'd written because Stephen had proposed that, the, that if the, he had a model of the universe that it, it would expand, but then it, it would con con contract back. I mean, if, you, if it was a, a k equals plus one without a cosmological constant. And for a while, he thought that if the entropy went up during the expansion phase, it would go down during the contraction phase. And it was based on some model that he had in which it looked like most of the wave function near when the universe was small would be ordered. So it, it looked like the dominant. But there was kind of a subtle effect there that, that the universes really might expand. And then when they contract back, they could have higher entropy. So I, I wrote a rebuttal paper to that. And at first, when I came to Cambridge, the, 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 the summer after that, he, uh, well, first, I think at first he told me I was quite wrong. But <laughs> the, the little, a few weeks later, he, he said, well, Alan Guth wanted to see a copy of this or something. And so I said, I said, do you think it might be right? Well, maybe, he said. So then he did, he did sort of concede on that issue after, after a few months. And then later, later he called this his, his greatest mistake, at least in science, though in the sense of a mistake that I think was great in the sense of having, having positive outcome was his, his idea that, that the black holes, that you would lose the information. Eventually, Hawking conceded that. And you won the bet. So yeah, I had, a bet, I had a bet with him that was not very well known. And in fact, and then there was a much more public bet with, with, that he had at a, at a meeting, at, at, that he conceded at a meeting that I didn't actually go to with John Preskill. And I remembered after that, after that meeting, hearing that, that Hawking had this bet, that uh, I sort of wondered, why didn't I ever make a bet? Because I couldn't remember. <laughs> and, and then, and, and then I, and, and so I thought, well, maybe because Hawking would probably never concede. And for a brief moment, I had this idea because, well, Alberta has a lottery, which I think is morally objectable. I, I think. Lotteries and trying to raise money, they, they raise it for you know good purposes. But trying to raise money like that, it seems like a, to me it's a tax on the stupid because, you know. But then I realized no, that's not an objection to a bet with Stephen. So, so anyway, then, then eventually I found the letter that I written to Bob Wall that I bet Vincent about this black hole information, and I said, well, I'd written to Wall that I had a copy that that I that I'd failed to pers to persuade Hawking that there is an S matrix, and we formalized our differences with a bet. And I thought, oh, there must be a bet. Where is this thing? And I had a pile of books and boxes in the corner, and I opened the boxes and pulled down. Halfway down, there was something that said 1980. Uh, correspondence, and I found in there, and there was this bet that I'd actually made with Stephen, and so then I made some copies of it, and then took the original and the copies off to uh, this, a com conference where Stephen was, and then after a little bit of hesitation, of how the wording was and whatever, then Stephen conceded, <laughs> conceded, <laughs> conceded the bet with me. Yes. Was there, mo was there money on this? Or? Oh yeah, it was. I, I made it the terms. I sort of wrote out the bet, and Stephen signed it. And but <laughs> I sort of gave him the slight advantage because I said that if, if he won, I would give him a British pound, and if I won, he'd give me a U.S. dollar. So I, <laughs> I wasn't. I part. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I gave, I gave him, I, I, I gave him on. It was partly, of course, he had, he had, because he'd written this paper at Caltech about the information loss. Instead of an S matrix, he put a slash to it. It was the dollar matrix. So he was proposing. So he would, if the dollar matrix was wrong, he'd have to give me a dollar. And so when he conceded the thing, he had his carers break, get out, and he, 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 what he actually gave me was a fake dollar. It was, a, it was a, it was a fake dollar given to him by one of his, by some admirer. That instead of a that Washington on had, had a picture of Marilyn Monroe, which is quite appropriate because Cocking considered Marilyn Monroe a model of the universe, and so he was admired. In fact, at one of his birthday celebrations, they had a Marilyn Monroe lookalike come in and perform for Hawking, and it was interesting to see Hawking there and and, and uh, Garrett and Tuff, Nobel laureate, standing up on the tables too. <laughs> but anyway, so let's see. What, what, so Maybe I've used up my. It's okay. No, no. I'll go a little bit more. I so, just want to make a comment on this point that uh, in his obituary of Steve, uh, Roger Penrose said that he was completely wrong in conceding that bet. 
Yeah, or at least he said, I am disappointed he conceded it, I think. Yeah. Whatever, anyway. On the issue of superficiality, because um, all the information black hole remains on its surface, doesn't it? Is that, is that, is it on well, it's a, it's a little ambiguous where it lies. I mean, you right. could say it lies on the surface. I mean, another view in some sense is it is all encoded in the gravitational field even way out at infinity and the never information never falls in it's it, it yes. I mean the energy and angular momentum in some sense are recorded in the gravitational field at infinity but does, does anything ever really cross the event horizon because time slows down from the point of view of an external well I see yeah so see from the outside you wouldn't see anything cross it but I mean it's believed that you know objects falling in would except there is a controversy now about whether at least old black holes might have a firewall and and so on so <clears throat> but all those problems arise Start with, so problem solved. Don't interrupt. Yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah, showing that you can't prove that a black hole that you have a, a, a non-cosmological trapped surface. You can't prove that it has a event horizon until you get very close to the, the ultimate future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in some sense, it's of course the actual because that's a boundary of what can escape. You're never going to see the boundary. So, so it's true. And in, and in some sense, I guess you might say that well, if information does get out, which is his current view, and more or less the view that I've held all along, although I've always had a little bit of doubts, but, but uh, th that maybe there's no black hole horizon uh, there. So, well, the other thing I guess I should mention that the, the, the Hawking did with, with Hartle, it was proposed a no boundary proposal for the quantum state of the universe. Now, and so, you know, I view this as a great thing because it's saying that that science may not just be how things evolve. It might not just be the dynamical equations, but maybe you could actually Propose scientifically what the the quantum state was, and you know, and then well, Frank Tipler has a somewhat related proposal for what the the quantum <coughs> state is. So, so that I think it's premature to expect the hartle hawking wave function to be to be the right wave function. And I and in fact, there are some technical difficulties and with it and so on. They even want a paper raise. But I think I viewed it as as sort of a really you know a really great idea that there that you you try to bring this. This into into science, uh, of course. Somebody could say, "Well, maybe you're reducing the 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 the, the gap." Uh, I mean, Stephen, of course, interpreted because of this no boundary. In some sense, it's saying you're using a path integral that's maybe dominated by a Euclidean thing, which which makes time like space. So there's no absolute point to the beginning. It's a little bit like the North Pole or the South Pole, I guess. You usually, is about like the South Pole, but you know, it's, you don't necessarily have to say the beginning is at the South Pole. It's a bit so he maybe argued there's no, be and that, well, and then furthermore, I guess he might say that that if it is this state, then God didn't have the freedom to. You don't need God to specify what the state is. So it, it, in some sense, he was attacking what you might say is a God of the gaps view, that well, we need God to say what the quantum state is. That he's, <clears throat> and I, I remember there was a small meeting at at, at Texas, uh, a Texas astrophysics meeting, and Hawking didn't go to this particular one where a number of us went up to the University of Texas at Austin from the downtown location of the meeting, and we discussed some of these things. And Jim Hartle discussed the Hartle-Hawking, but but Jim was never much one for emphasizing the philosophical points. And I was trying to say, well, you know, this is a really great idea. And then Bryce DeWitt, one of the fathers of quantum gravity, said to me, yeah, but you don't want to give any God any choice. And before I could think of an answer, another Carol Kukar said, yes, but that's his choice. In other words, if God had created the universe by this no boundary wave function, then that would be God's choice. It's, it would be, we would just be discovering his choice. It wouldn't necessarily eliminate God's, God's choice. So anyway, well, I probably should come to bring to this to sort of a close, but it, it really was, I mean, it, you know, it took a lot of time being living with Hawking in his, in his house and helping out, but we had times discussions, you know, and sometimes he'd raise questions, and of course, most of the time, he would come to the answer before I, but with my selective memory, I basically only remember the one time in which I managed to get the, que the answer first before <laughs> we, got, we got there by very selective memory. So anyway, but Stephen, of course, yeah, I, I, well, you all know that he's overcome enormous physical adversity and and you know is very persevered very much with that and so you know I consider him a, you know an outstanding scientist and he was certainly a great mentor and you know I owe a huge part of my career to him not only getting the positions I have but also having ideas to work on I was counting up you know there's 10 papers of mine that have Hawking in the title and and far more that you know using his ideas so 
you know, I'm extremely grateful to him and also to his whole family was very, very kind and generous to me at the, at the time <clears throat> when I was there. So I, I, I really, uh, you know, re really appreciate, appreciate that and really, really am very thankful for the time that I've, that I've, had, that I've had with him. Thank you. Thank you.